Jordan and Gretzky, Serena and Ruth. Remembering great ones is easy to do. The boy of soccer tailgates who spent their whole lives Long snapping footballs and catching sash flies Their guys, remember that guy I'm just here so I don't get fined. So y'all can sit here and ask me all the questions y'all want to. I'm going to answer with the same answer. So y'all can shoot if y'all remember that guy. The show where we mind our memories for nuggets of nostalgia about peripheral players past and present. Hey there, folks. I'm one of your hosts, James. I'm also just here so I don't get fined. Not going to get fined at all. Thanks for being here, James Diaz. Glad to be back with you once again. We do have a very special guest, though. It is the one reporter that actually managed to get an answer out of Marshawn Lynch that famous day. Please introduce yourself. See, the, the, the problem is I was actually a plant because I was Marshawn's script writer and the one who told him exactly what to say. So it was all planned out. But, you know, just another job for me, the very special guest, Xavier. And I got paid in Skittles. That's why I had all of those Skittles back in college in my dorm room for all you drunk assholes to come and eat at two in the morning. Marshawn Lynch paid me in Skittles. Hey, I was a drunk gentleman. Okay. <laughs> Let's get that clear. He was a drunk gentleman and I was a tired, just done with work person that was about to get drunk at 2 a.m. hungry for Skittles. Those 2 a.m. James returns to the house with pints of what, what's the real Oreo thing? Hydrox, Hydrox cooking. Hydrox. The original yes. cream cookie. Hydrox. Yes, indeed. Yes, I'll, I'll go ahead no, and those, those were magical evenings. I will talk about ice cream at some point today. I promise you that much. But before we talk about ice cream, let's talk about sports. I'm going to get things out of the way. I don't want to be here right now. I don't want to be sitting with two people talking about sports. I don't want to think about sports. I don't want to watch sports. I hate all sports. There is no good in the world. Uh, I am embarrassed to have ever believed that there was good in the world. I am ashamed of myself for allowing people to talk me into thinking that this year would be different. It is a mark from which I may never recover. And I hate sports. Ace is up to nothing. Awesome. Uh, Even more heart wrenching when they lose in five games, man. No, think about it for a second, because I, I say often I'm my favorite part of sports. While I love the stuff on the field, like I do love the overarching narratives of it. I am someone that is drawn to that story. And how fucking perfect would it be if the Orioles, this 91 or something streak of not getting swept in a series, finally get swept in a five-game set in the playoffs. And then immediately after that, it's followed up by the Aces going up 2-0, a lead that has never failed to win a playoff series in the history of the WNBA. Of course they're going to fucking lose this series. Are you kidding me? I mean, they could. The series could change going back to New York, but... At risk of saying positive things about your teams that there are, you can say what you want. There are no positive things about any of the teams, period. There is no reason to believe in anything until there's proof otherwise. And that's how I'm going to treat the rest of my life from this week forward. Well, the good news is that when this episode comes out, it is mathematically impossible for the Canucks to be more than 10 points back. So, okay, there's one thing before we move on from the Orioles that I would like to say, because obviously this is in reference to the Orioles. And like, obviously in a couple of years, I'll look back on this. I'm like, yeah, it was great. Since the 2014 seasons of both Ravens and Orioles, 2014 was a good year for both teams. I'm not going to sit here and complain. You know, Ravens get a big win over the Steelers in the playoffs before bowing out. And uh, the Orioles get the home games against Detroit and then eventually finish the sweep in Detroit. Do you know how many playoff games the city of Baltimore has won since 2014? Because I want you to picture for a moment. I want you to really sit with this. 2014, all of Joel Embiid's career is ahead of us. All of Carson Wentz's time with the Eagles is ahead of us, not to mention Jalen Hurts' time. The Knicks don't even have Julius Randle yet, their savior. The Flyers are still like a relatively competent team at that point with guys like Giroux and Voracek. The Yankees have not even sniffed Aaron Judge in the majors. I want you to picture all of that. How many playoff games do you think the city of Baltimore has won since 2014? I'm trying to think, because I 
don't I think the Ravens have been one and done every year since then. And if that's the, the answer case, zero. zero. The answer is exactly one. The Ravens beat the Titans in Tennessee. Oh, I remember there that not game. Been a single playoff victory in the city of Baltimore since JJ Hardy scored on Delman Young's double against the Tigers in game two of the ALDS. The Phillies, this week the Phillies have had as many wins as the city of Baltimore has had in the last nine years. Like, make a case if you want. I ran through the full list. I don't think there is a city. And yes, I have Vancouver who has won series since then. I have the Spurs who have won series since then. I have the Aces. And sure, the Capitals are nearby and the Nationals are nearby. And so is the Washington football team, which I'm pretty sure has won at least one by now. But truly, just the city of Baltimore I do not think there is a single city that has had a more miserable nine years of playoffs in the last nine years. If you do the qualifier of playoffs, then probably because like Buffalo is still pretty miserable, even with a Buffalo got their playoff street, their playoff appearance drought snapped directly at the expense of the Ravens. And then two years later, knocked the Ravens out after their one win, reject Buffalo. San Diego sucks. San Diego has had a playoff series win with the Padres. They also got basically their first ever free agent signing. The only person that the Orioles have had is like a star level athlete in the last 15 years who they traded away for fucking nothing, except a guy that got shelled in an inning and a third in game three of the ALDS. Hell, the San Diego Chargers got a win over the Ravens in the playoffs. And then they moved. That's what I'm saying. They're worse than the city that has lost a team in that last nine years. I was going to say Oakland is like the only one that I could say because you lose the the Warriors are great and then you lose them. And then the athletics are horrible and you're also going to lose them. You did get the Warriors title first, though, and you got a couple of those. Now that that raises the question of if the Sixers won a championship and they left within five years, would I be okay with it? And I think I would, because it would probably be the healthiest possible outcome for all parties. I get the championship, and then we get our nice clean break, and I can just become, you know, generalist NBA fan. Like, look, I... This does not make me a better fan than you guys, but there is a fundamental difference in the three of us and our relationships to our biggest teams. And it is simply a product of our birth. It's nothing any of us control, but, like, I'm born and raised a couple miles away from those stadiums. Like I go past those stadiums every single day on my commute to work. And so much of my love for those two teams is civic pride for a city that is shit on constantly on the national stage. Like again, not trying to be dramatic. Baltimore doesn't have a good national image. I think we can all objectively say that. And you know what? Turns out everyone's right. This is indeed a Rust Belt cesspool, and I was wrong to ever believe in anything else. Whatever. Believing in things is overrated. Anyway, what's making memories for you guys? Well, up here in Philadelphia on (laughs) Wednesday night, my beloved Philadelphia team welcomed their hated rival back to Philadelphia once again. Of course, we all remember what happened in the playoffs last year. So it was no surprise when the same thing happened again Wednesday night that's right, folks. The Celtics beat the Sixers 112 to 101, and an NBA preseason is finally here. Xavier, how many qualifiers did it take for you to get that he was doing a Celtics Sixers bit? I mean, I figured he was doing that from the beginning because I didn't <laughs> I, I didn't think he would do that to you right away. And I also thought that he would take more shots at Orlando Arcia if he was gonna talk about the Phillies. So I mean, look, I'm at risk of saying things about the conclusion of that series that will be proven wrong by the time this comes out on Monday. I just want to say, in the aftermath of Game 3, for the Atlanta Braves' collective reaction to be, yeah, that wasn't supposed to get out, those horrible reporters, I don't trust the media, that is the biggest loser shit I've ever heard in my life. That I've ever heard in my life. Like, it's fucking Jake Mintz from Cespedes Barbecue. One of the nicest goddamn guys in the world. Like, as someone that has gotten to meet him, as someone whose emails have appeared on their shows a couple times, like, just an absolutely splendid person. And the city of Atlanta just decided he is, he's public enemy number one now. Like, for Travis Darno to, like, bring up, like, the clubhouse as a sanctuary. Like, dude, fuck off. There's clearly a line of stuff that is said in the clubhouse that, like, shouldn't be leaked and should be leaked. I think, haha, ha, Boy Harper, 
is pretty goddamn innocuous. However, Bryce Harper is a psychopath that will use anything to get any sort of advantage, and we do love him for that. We'll see how that series ends up, but no, preseason basketball is back. And uh, I don't know. It's been, there's a lot of uh, positive vibes coming out of the Sixers, especially for a team that has a player that says that management openly lies and that they'll never be a part of them. It <laughs> certainly looks like James Harden is a part of the Sixers. He hasn't played in any preseason games yet, but you know all of those best shape of his life reports are coming out. All the players in camp are speaking glowingly of him. But the most exciting thing about the Sixers, Doc Rivers has ended his reign of terror. We will have to listen to him during Sixers games a lot, which is going to be really annoying. But thankfully, he's not coaching him anymore. Nick Nurse is coaching him. And to hear the staggering amount of players who are simply observing, yeah, like we're like running plays. It's crazy. <laughs> it's, it's just really hard to not get your hopes up. And Nick Nurse, like I, I draw a lot of parallels I was drawing this parallel, and it's a parallel that only I can draw because only I am a Sixers and a Newcastle fan. But Doc Rivers and Steve Bruce are like very much the same person in my head where they played on a lot of good teams back in the day, and they have a lot of friends in the industry. So they keep getting propped up as somebody that's actually a good coach when actually they are the biggest fucking idiot that you can possibly be at that sport. I've said so many times that Doc Rivers rides that 2008 ring like nobody's business. And I'm not going to pretend like I know a lot about ball. I do not like truly know ball. Even I know Doc Rivers is riding that 08 ring into the fucking ground. And also that 08 Celtics team. There has never been a team that has refused to shut the fuck up about one title and painting themselves like they were some dynasty. It's the most frustrating thing about the Celtics because like... Not the racism? We, well... Partially the racism. But as a white person, the racism doesn't affect me as much. A half white person. Half of me is uh, very disappointed right now. But no, I, it's just amazing to see how amazed all the players are at the facts that they're being coached by their basketball coach. Um, it inspires a lot of hope. And I, I really think we have that thing going on where the Raptors always gave and beat the most trouble. And it's like, okay, Nick Nurse knows how to expose the weaknesses. Now it's Nick Nurse's turn to cover up those weaknesses and come with the counter to what teams are trying to do. So, I mean, look, I would be lying if I said that I'm going to believe in this team at all until I'm watching them play in game one of the Eastern Conference Finals. You should be believing in things is overrated, as we've established. they, They need to crush a new frontier. And and I get it for you, like for you, the Orioles. I wouldn't believe until I see them in Game One of the World Series. At never that point, gonna I think- happen. I I am glad there is one specific pain I will never have to experience that the two of you have had to experience. That is, I will never have to watch a team lose the World Series. It's not great. I, I don't I don't uh, encourage it. Although I've also my Philadelphia mindset has like it's like Stockholm syndrome where I'm just like. I don't care if we win or lose the championship. Just making it is an honor. It's, it's like the it's like the Grammys or the, the Emmys, whatever they say. Just being nominated mm-hmm. is an honor. So, look, hopefully the Sixers get nominated to have a chance to go to the NBA Finals this year. I would be so fucking happy. But till then, going to keep riding the vibes. Tyrese Maxey, breakout season, all-star. Paul Reed, 15 and 10. Many people are saying it. I'm many. I'm the only one. But I'm saying it. Trust the process, baby. TTP. Hey, Xavier, what you got rattling around that big, beautiful head of yours? Yeah, so real quick, I did want to give a shout out to Rintaro Sasaki, who was the number one prospect coming out of Japanese high school baseball, expected to be the number one overall pick in, in the Nippon League draft. And he said, fuck that. I'm going to go to America for college. And it looks like he's probably going to go to Vanderbilt you know, the best baseball school in the country. And this means that although he can't make any money over the next four years because of student visa rules with NIL, does mean that if he's good, he can get drafted in the first round of the MLB draft and become an MLB player at the age of 21 and make way more money than he would have if he came over as an international free agent and was restricted to, you know, amateur signing bonus pools 
or not having to wait till he's 25 and be posted by a team. If this works out for him, we could see, you know, more prospects doing this in the future, which would, one, incentivize the Nippon League to pay their young players better to avoid this, but two, give alternative pathways to really talented players to come to America earlier than otherwise they'd be able to without having to, you know, make a deal with their team to get posted and come over at the age of 27 or 28. So I think that's really interesting, and I'm really excited to see what happens with that. But that's going to be a while till we see the fruits of that come off. The other thing is, I get to watch hockey today. The Rangers start the season today. I'm very excited. Unlike James, I am an eternal optimist when it comes to sports, unless it's the Jets. But even with the Jets, I've gotten to a point where I'm so pessimistic about the Jets, I'm optimistic about anything that happens. So it's like a weird like 360. I, so really... I used to be that way, and then all of you convinced me that things might be different this year. It's all right. I don't. I don't feel bad about trying to make you positive. Listen, uh, for 162 games, it was different, and then for three games, it was very much not different. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, along the lines of baseball, <laughs> of hockey, <laughs> I did want to give a, a a quick note to something that's frustrated me to no end. So a couple of months ago, the NHL banned pride jerseys and all specialty themed jerseys. Thanks to douchebag ex-flyer Ivan Provorov. So after that, you know, there was obviously a lot of different, a lot of other players started saying, oh, I don't want to wear these for religious reasons or whatever. And unfortunately, the NHL caved to a very small minority and banned those jerseys. And then just this week, the NHL decided that we can't even let anyone have something small and also banned pride tape on sticks, which was a very small thing that, you know, players had done to support the LGBT community. And like, it was the only alternative stick tape that players were allowed to have other than black and white. And credit to the players, a lot of them said, hey, we're just going to fucking do it anyway. I don't care. And one of my favorites is Flyers forward Scott Lawton. He said, you'll probably see me with the pride tape on that anyway. If they want to say something, they can. Just say, like, what are they going to do? Are they going to penalize me? Are they going to find me for having pride tape? That's going to make them look like shit. And I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. And apparently, you know, Lawton has been, like, a very vocal ally of the LGBT community. Last year, during the Provorov stuff, he personally met with, like, 50-plus members of the LGBTQ community for a post-game meet-and-greet. Made time for everybody. Apparently JVR was with him, so apparently the two of them are like vocal allies, but love that the players are like, hey, you know, if you're going to take away the jerseys because of a vocal minority, and now you're even going to take away this one small thing that we like to do anyway, like, we're going to become vocal and say, nah, fuck you, we're going to do it anyway. And I'm just waiting for the first player to get fined for supporting Pride and the NHL having to defend that. Fuck the NHL as a organization, but I do love hockey and I am excited for this season. I am excited for the inaugural season of the nitty gritty dirt league, which has been formed with several friends of the show, including the three of us. You two guys are lame and don't have team names. I will go ahead and say, I'm very proud of frozen three Frokio drift. I have to think of a good name. No, I, I just, I need to consult with myself really uh, to come up with a good name, but it is coming. I promise. Well, I can give you guys some time to decide because I'll go ahead and move us on to what we have come here to do. It is now season eight. And so when I came into this as the winner of our most recent normal episode, I had another one of those guys where it was it was someone that I wanted to bring in. And I've been trying to figure out what's the category, what's the angle that I'm interested in approaching this person with and that I'm interested in hearing the two of you go. And the the way I decided to go, these are going to be rule changes today that we're talking about. Guys who have influenced some kind of change, whether it was certain behaviors on the field, off the field, whether it was about safety, health, like despite Baltimore's recent insistence to the contrary, sports are supposed to be entertainment. And I want to talk about a guy who understood that and understood it to a point that these leagues ostensibly entertainment leagues that exist to put on just that 
actually had to stop it to keep one person from rising too far above the rest of the pack. This one that I'm going to start with, try and get us on a, a lighter note, is just about preventing someone from doing cool shit. But that's what you have to do with the guy as cool as the guy that I want to lead things off today. Better known as Chocolate Thunder, I want to talk about Daryl Dawkins. Okay, okay, Daryl Dawkins, I'm into it. Well, just Chocolate Thunder is the greatest nickname of all time. There's nothing close. There's nothing in the same realm. Chocolate Thunder is the greatest nickname of all time. It's good. I'm also very partial to the human highlight reel, I have to say. Human highlight reel is pretty excellent. I'm a sucker for the Admiral, if I'm being completely honest. Like the Admiral. I mean, you're also a Spurs fan. Yeah, but like I don't think anyone else in the Spurs has I, like even Iceman, I don't know, that's kind of overdone. Like everyone does something icy. I, the Admiral, it's commanding. I do think I do like the big fundamental over the Admiral. See, that's not one that like actually got used, is the problem with it. Fair. But I mean, the, no nickname better encapsulates the player than Fair. the big fundamental. Fair. Except for maybe, I think, Chocolate Thunder. Let's get back to Chocolate Thunder, who, despite his insistence, is not born on the planet Lovetron. He is instead born in Orlando, January 11th, 1957, to Harriet James and Frank Dawkins. But largely, he is going to be raised by a grandmother, that is Amanda Celestine Jones. And it is a pretty, like, not destitute, but certainly at some level of poverty upbringing. He is a big guy from a young age. He is already like clearly the largest person on the high school team when he gets there. He's playing center very early. And by the time he is a senior, he's already reached six foot 10. Eventually as a pro, he'll be six foot 11. So he's basically there as an 18 year old. As a senior, he puts 32 points per game and 21 rebounds. That's a lot. It feels like he was missing intentionally to get extra rebounds at that point. Like he's so much bigger than everyone else. Just throwing up against the backboard just to catch it himself. I would imagine it's instead the team just hucking up really bad shots for him to essentially <laughs> alley-oop off and talk. Like, you're, you're close. You're close. It's, it sounds like Andre Drummond almost like mm-hmm. the previous era. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Except, you know, with some points. But certainly that many rebounds and a state title to boot in 1975. So schools are like falling over themselves to recruit him. And it comes down to a trio eventually. The two big K's, Kentucky and Kansas, and then relatively local FSU. However, after much thought, Dawkins decides he will not be attending any of those three schools. In fact, he will not be attending college at all. Daryl Dawkins is the very first high school player to jump directly to the NBA when he declares in the 1975 draft. This is essentially the idea like he is coming from a hard scrabble background he wants to make money as quickly as possible and nil is out of the question and so in the 1975 draft he is selected fifth overall by your philadelphia 76ers signs a huge at the time seven-year deal one million dollars altogether and the sixers that first year as you might imagine from a team that just had the fifth overall pick not very good dawkins plays about four and a half minutes per game in 37 games altogether and the next year Regular season, he's still languishing on the bench, even as the team is improving. But we get to the playoffs. And whereas he'd been playing 11 minutes per game in the regular season, jumps all the way up to 18 because they run through a stretch of big men in the Eastern Conference playoffs, including most notably against the Houston Rockets, Moses Malone, who himself, a few years earlier, had become the first high school player to jump directly to the ABA when he was drafted by the Utah Stars there. They do get through the Rockets. They get all the way to the finals. He is matched up once again against an excellent big man, the Blazers' Bill Walton. And sadly, after jumping out to a 2 nothing lead, the Blazers and Bill Walton do get the best. Dawkins, though, is doing the number one thing that Diaz, I think you, and many Philly fans, uh, but have always said, like, it's the number one thing you want. He's showing that he fucking cares. Gets into a fight at one point with Maurice Lucas from Portland. And, like, after that loss and after the game, Goes in and tears a toilet out of the locker rooms. Tears a locker stall out. I'm not entirely sure how that works, but apparently whatever he tore out, he then used to barricade the door. And like, this is a massive six foot 11, 20 year old who just went on this playoff run because of coming in from high school. So like, he is establishing his passion. He just needs a chance to establish the skills. If I was alive for those 77 finals, I think destroying a toilet and ripping open like a fucking stall. That, that would be the least of the destruction that would have happened in the city of Philadelphia if they blew a fucking 2-0 lead. One you was guys would enough. do plenty 
this is a player. <laughs> no, yeah, no, it's and presumably game six. I guess game six would have been in Portland. Well, no, presumably they did a two three two. They did oh, a two, it's two three, three two. two. So this is okay. So you win two in Philly. You go to Portland. All the talk up to game six. You're convincing yourself we still have home court. We still have home court. God fucking damn it. Now I'm mad about a series that I wasn't even alive for in <laughs> fucking 15 years, James. Good, me, good work, James. Let me, let me bring it down. Let me bring it down. At this point in his first two years, he's played 96 games. He's averaged across those two years 8.8 minutes uh, and like put up four points and almost three rebounds at that time. Like no stats at all. 77 78 now. 70 games, 11.7 points, 7.9 rebounds, 24.6 minutes. And he is shooting 57.5% from the field, which is second in the league. The Sixers get a one seed for the second straight year, and they do reach the conference semis. They do unfortunately get taken down by the hot shooting of the Bullets. Bullets do down them. But like Dawkins is fully established at this point as not just like a low level rotational piece, but as a foundational piece in this team to the point where Philly is confident enough to trade a two-time NBA All-Star at the time, an ABA All-Star, George McGinnis is going to get traded away, and that allows Dawkins and Caldwell Jones to fully just take over the front court at this point. They get to basically make a name for themselves, and I'm going to use that as a lead into real quick discuss, like, obviously the number one thing about Daryl Dawkins, and we've already touched on, it's the names, because Chocolate Thunder is incredible. Chocolate Thunder is not the only nickname that is listed for Daryl Dawkins in many, many different sources. I'm going to present just a selection of the ones from Basketball Reference specifically. We've got Dawk, Big Dawk, Squawkin' Dawkin', Double D, Sweet D, Cool Breeze, Pure Pleasure, Master of Disaster, Demon of Destin, Candy Slam, Dr. Jam, Sir Slam, Sir Dunk, Dr. Dunk, Dunk You Very Much, and Zandacan, The Mad Dunker. Half of those sound like condom brands or like <laughs> a Trojan, like like a Trojan marketing campaign. It's like cool breeze, pure pleasure. Get the double D Trojan condom. I mean, honestly, <laughs> for Chocolate Thunder hailing from the planet Love Tron, probably a sponsor deal that he would work out nowadays. By the way, Chocolate Thunder, do you know who gave him that name? It is not an athlete. It is a famous musician. A Jimi famous- Hendrix. It is a famous basketball fan musician, a musician who does famously love sitting courtside and enjoying a basketball game. And I'm trying to give you a hint. I have not said watching basketball. It's Stevie Wonder. Oh. <laughs> because never forget, Stevie Wonder loves being at basketball games courtside. Again, cannot technically say watching. Yeah, he's experiencing it. Now, something you might have gathered from all of those nicknames is that there is one thing in particular that Daryl Dawkins does very, very well. And that is throw it down. He dunks excessively. And much like he has a nickname, he has nicknames for many of these dunks. We've got the in your face disgrace, the turbo sexophonic delight, the spine chiller supreme, and the get out of the way in backboard swaying game delaying. If you ain't grooving, you best get moving dunk. I mean, look. There's a, there's a rhyme pattern. There's there's a little little bit. There's of truth multiple rhyme last patterns. One. <laughs> it's like it's fucking incredible, and he is clearly like this big showman as we enter the seventy nine eighty season. And this is like we are getting to what we are here to discuss today. It's his first year as the unquestioned starter. In all of his eighty games, he starts. And he plays 31.8 minutes a game, getting up to 14.7 points per game, 8.7 rebounds. He is just rattling rims. And so we reach November 13th, 1979. We are in Kansas City playing the Kings. The Sixers are 12 and 3 at the time, Kings 5 and 11. And Dawkins gets passed low in the paint. He gathers, goes up, even before he comes down. Like when he's at the peak of his jump, you can see Kings forward Bill Robenzine there. He is already shielding his head and running away as quickly as he can in this split second before Dawkins absolutely shatters the backboard of this basket. It is just destroyed. Glass explodes. Dr. J gets some in his fro. It is just fully onto the court. The game is delayed for cleanup. But this crowd, an away crowd, like this is not a bunch of Sixers fans. They are on their feet, uproariously just loving it. 
Now, to be clear, Daryl Dawkins, not the first person to ever break a backboard. Uh, that would actually go to former actor, MLB player, and Boston Celtic for a brief time, Chuck Connors. He was technically the first because he shot a ball once in like 1946 at a rim that wasn't properly set up. And so just when it hit the rim, it destroyed it. So that's the first ever time in a game that a player destroyed a backboard. The Bullets that we mentioned earlier, there was a guy on there named Gus Johnson. He broke three in his career. Uh, the ABA's Pittsburgh Condors had this guy, Charlie Hentz. It was like a one-paragraph Wikipedia page, but apparently one time in a game, he broke a backboard. They replaced it with a wooden backboard on that side and kept playing through. And then he broke the backboard on the other side of the court. And they're like, all right, well, we don't even have a backup wooden one that we can put up this time, so I guess we have to call the game. But this was a level of artistry that truly had not been reached yet in the destruction of a backboard. And like I should mention, it does have a specific name. Of course, Dawkins does dub this one. The Chocolate Thunder Flying, Robenzine Crying, Teeth Shaking, Glass Breaking, Rump Roasting, Bun Toasting, Wham Bam, Glass Breaker, Jam I Am. And the Sixers lose that game. But this is the unquestioned highlight. It is still in Daryl Dawkins' mind about a month later. This time, the Sixers welcome another team to town, the San Antonio Spurs, here on December 5th. Dawkins is, once again, waiting near the baseline. He receives a pass, and he jumps up. And this time, when he jumps up, I paused it while I was watching this video earlier today. His own teammate, Bobby Jones, is not only kind of running away, but he is clearing people out. And, like, I, I watch basketball. I know that players clear other players out. This is different. Bobby Jones is trying to like protect players from the other team from what's about to happen as Daryl Dawkins goes up here at the Spectrum and destroys his second backboard in a month. It is a little bit different. This one like spider webs through the hole and then he just kind of like rips the rim out. So it's not as explosive. It's not the same level of theatricality, but it is still an absolute delight for now the home crowd. Dawkins admitted he wanted to put on a show for the home crowd and what he's revealed here is Dawkins knows how to break backboards now. This is something he can more or less do when he wants to do it. And the league decides that much like the NFL is the no fun league, the NBA, they are going to call themselves no broken backboards allowed. Larry O'Brien himself basically calls Daryl Dawkins into his office and tells him that uh, from that point forward, and this will be league-wide, they will be instituting a $5,000 delay of game fine any time that anyone breaks a backboard and they will also, at the end of this season, be replacing all of the rims league-wide with a breakaway design where the joint between the glass and the rim itself is designed to bend and, and just kind of give way instead of snapping. The Sixers are undeterred by this, you know, attempt to basically neuter the most exciting part of their team not named Julia Serving. And they make it all the way back to the Eastern Conference Finals in 81 and the Finals in 82. Dawkins, you know, starts all six games in those finals. He's also wearing these, like, really big gold chains. At the end of those 81 finals, Larry O'Brien decides, all right, fine. If the backboards is not enough, I'm also going to ban wearing gold chains during games. So now Daryl Dawkins, there in those six games in the finals, becomes the last player to ever wear gold chains with his nicknames in just giant gold block letters across his chest. Not allowed to do that anymore in the league. He's just too fun. And Larry O'Brien refuses to allow it. You had the chains in the 80s. You had the ninja headbands right around like 2018. The NBA is the true NFL. They're the true no fun league. They just can't let Daryl Dawkins be this much cooler than everybody else. They can't have backboards explode during games and shatter glass on players and spectators. You know, yeah. just... <laughs> how dare they take that away from us? It's our God given right. To show up to a Spectrum Arena, sorry, Wells Fargo Center, <laughs> forgot that doesn't exist anymore, and get a fucking backboard broken in front of us. If glass gets in our skin, that's just a free souvenir. The doctor will let you keep it when they take it out. Um, we should get back to, like, the sport for a moment. <laughs> um, like I said, they make the uh, Eastern Conference Finals, they make the Finals. Still can't quite get over the hump. They're running into the Lakers or Celtics every time here. These are good Lakers and Celtics teams, in particular the Lakers teams. They're led by Kareem, and he's just killing them. And so the Sixers decide, okay, we've got to change our approach to this legendary big man. And so they decide to make a series of trades. They're going to clear out their front court for none other than that Moses Malone that we met a while ago with the Rockets. Much like Daryl Dawkins, again, a high school player, came straight into the league. He is now going to be added to these Sixers. 
with Dawkins getting sent to the New Jersey Nets. Admittedly, this super works for the Sixers. They win the championship the very next year. Moses Malone wins MVP. So, like, it, it goes pretty damn well for them. And initially looks very good for Dawkins, New Jersey. 49-33, and 33, the record for the Nets that year. The very best they had had since the ABA-NBA merger. They make the playoffs for a second time. Again, this was only the second time in their time in the NBA they made it. And Doc, the next year, actually leads the team in win shares with 7.9, which is like a very respectable level for a well-balanced team. Think kind of a, a you know, mid-2000s Detroit Pistons. He has a career-high 16.8 points. He does also have an NBA record 386 personal fouls. Now, that is an impressive total, but... I think if Gadget Jones were allowed the playing time of a Daryl Ball, <laughs> he could have easily gotten way past that. <laughs> His per 36 is, is the NBA record, probably. That second year, the Nets go 45 and 37, get the sixth seed, and they get a first round matchup with none other than Dr. J, Moses Malone, and the Philadelphia 76ers. The Nets take games one and two in Philly. Drop three and four at home. So love a series where all of the home fans are just miserable as we go into the tiebreaker. Back in the spectrum as a winner-take-all game. And Daryl Dawkins absolutely puts Moses Malone in a box as the New Jersey Nets take it in a squeaker. 101-98. What a win for Doc. Which is good because we're going to need that to keep ourselves warm as we do enter now his wilderness years. He played... 81 games both of his first two years in New Jersey. Only plays 96 over the next three. Injuries hold him and the Nets back. They have no more playoff series wins. They got a couple more first round exits. And then ahead of 87-88, he is traded to Utah. Funny, I think, because that is the state that Moses Malone was drafted to. So just a little more intertwining between those two. It's part of a big, like, seven-player, three-team trade that Utah, for their part, immediately regrets, at least with Daryl Dawkins, because after four games... He is traded for two second rounders in cash to the Detroit Pistons. The next two years barely plays for them. 16 total games in the regular season and absolutely zero in the playoffs. However, he is beloved in the bad boy Pistons locker room. Everyone's favorite teammate. He is honestly Udonis Haslam with fewer minutes. And his very last season is that 89 season with the Detroit Pistons. And despite Again, recording zero minutes in the playoffs. He does get to end his NBA career, at least there, with a ring. He was, after this, offered a spot with the Orlando Magic for their inaugural year, which is an incredible sliding door, because just picture for a moment the damage that Shaquille O'Neal and Daryl Dawkins together could, like, <laughs> wreck on just the infrastructure of the league as a whole. But instead... He goes to Italy when this is still kind of like a relatively novel thing for a still relatively productive uh, NBA player to some extent to do, but goes and has about a half decade there between three clubs, makes a bunch of all-star teams, comes back, joins the Harlem Globetrotters. He joins the CBA's Sioux Falls Sky Force. He coaches the ABA's Newark Express. He then also coaches and plays for the IBA's Winnipeg Cyclone. That's the International Basketball Association. Then he plays for the USBL, the United States Basketball League's Pennsylvania Valley Dogs, dog spelled D-A-W-G. And if he didn't have that dog in him, I mean, he would have very literally had dog on him. This man could not be kept off the court. He's the absolute definition of a lifer. Sadly, we must acknowledge that on August 27th, 2015, that life does come to an end. Daryl suffers a fatal heart attack at the age of 58, and he is fully honored by the league as a whole he is acknowledged as this incredible character so powerful that again he had to be stopped by larry o'brien daryl dawkins would have been the only person that anyone would have been talking whenever daryl dawkins isn't on the screen i need all the other characters to be asking where's daryl dawkins while the sixers were getting ready to honor him i do also want to acknowledge that a rep went to a local ice cream store and thankfully ran into a store manager who happened to be a fan of hoops. And so Dawkins got commemorated with a flavor by the ice cream establishment, the Franklin Fountain, called the Chocolate Thunder. This was an absolutely delectable espresso base with chocolate-covered espresso beans and little uh, pretzel bits in there, recreating a sundae that they had, the lightning rod. This was me. I helped make that happen. It was super cool. It was like the closest I've ever gotten to contributing to some fabric of the sporting world that all of our lives share. 
and it was an honor to help honor this guy that I didn't know a lot about before this flavor that we made. So I am happy now that we get to honor and celebrate this man. He has asked people to call him many things. I'm only going to ask you all to call him one thing, which is a guy. It, it's hard to argue against it. No, I, I always love Chocolate Thunder. It was, I remember like, I think I was like probably 12 when I realized that he didn't get to play on the 83 championship team because you just so think of him as a fabric of like, oh yeah, it's Mo Cheeks and it's Dr. J and it's Daryl Dawkins. And then we got him out of there and we got a better Daryl Dawkins whose name was Moses in there who also had alliteration in his name. For, I love how many times him and Moses Malone just like go back and forth through all of that. But I also love that we can now always liken a situation like this to when the Red Sox upgraded from Nomar Garcia Parra to Orlando Cabrera. Clearly a better player. I think this one might have been a little bit different, but <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's a good parallel. Daryl Dawkins, he was one of those guys that was always at Sixers games too after he retired like if you went to a Sixers game, you could lay odds. All right, they're going to show World Be Free on the screen at some point. They're going to show Daryl Dawkins on the screen at some point. And if Allen Iverson actually showed up and claimed his tickets this time, they'll show him too. <laughs> Very not to ever think about the Orioles again, but Boog Powell, former MVP for the Orioles, but like otherwise kind of a, a forgotten guy. He's very similar, has a barbecue stand there. And he's that like star level player. Clearly an incredibly good productive player, rich history, but not one of the first guys you think of. And so kind of a, a, a niche one for people that go to those games a lot. It's fine because you said Boog has a barbecue, right? Boog's barbecue, yeah. Greg Lazinski has a barbecue at Citizens Bank <laughs> Park, and I think he <laughs> occupies like an extremely similar spot in Philly's history. Well, that is, that is an incredible parallel. But before we go off on other tracks, I'd like to stay parallel to this topic and find out about some other guys that have been responsible for rule changes in the league. Hopefully not just in the attempt to make sports less fun, but perhaps for safety or something. Well, that sounds like it's a, it's a tee up for me. So we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll sandwich stories that don't involve athletes dying in the pursuit of their dreams with this story. So I've always spoiler been alert. spoiler alert. Although I give I give it away in my preamble, so it's not a, a massive spoiler, but it's it's no secret to either of you or any of the listeners. I've always been a massive fan of boxing. To this day, I'll still contend that a top level fight is the pinnacle of sports. There is no sporting event that is better than a hyped fight that meets its expectations. Whether it's Arturo Gotti suffering a liver shot and still somehow getting back up to fight back against Mickey Ward. Or if it's Deontay Wilder being out on his feet but still throwing haymakers with everything he's got at Tyson Fury in their third fight. There's just something that's so awe-inspiring about seeing an athlete confront their mortal fears and persevere through that and the push for more. Thankfully, in Arturo Gatti's fighting career, at least, he did ultimately persevere. Deontay Wilder persevered through that fight with Tyson Fury, has gone on to record more knockouts. But there are those fighters who have given their life in the pursuit of victory. While these tragedies are seemingly inevitable, as long as this sport will exist, there used to be a lot more of them. Uh, it's a lot better now. And kind of like OSHA, some of the regulations are written in blood, which is why I have brought forward today to talk about my guy, one of the greatest boxers in the history of Korea, Dooku Kim. Dooku Kim, making sure, so like three syllable, three name. Yeah. So if we're going by Korean naming traditions, it's Kim Dooku. But Kim, cool. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. There's only like 200 family names in Korea and only like 60 of them are actually in use, which is why... There's so many Lees and Kims mm -hmm. and well, well, we'll get to a Lee later on, Xavier. I promise <laughs> you that. But you know, because we are stupid Americans, we will give the Americanization of the name, uh, which is Dooku Kim. Dooku was born July 29th, 1959, in Ganwon Province, uh, which is about 100 miles east of Seoul. And like a lot of fighters, and particularly fighters who come from Asian corners of the world, uh, he grew up in extreme poverty. And you might think, what does extreme poverty mean? Um, extreme poverty means that for a reasonably long enough part of his childhood, at least a couple of weeks, 
he was a roommate with a cow in an outhouse because it was the only shelter that his family could possibly find. It was obviously a very rough upbringing for Dooku. Um, on his second birthday, his father passed away. And shortly thereafter, he fell gravely ill, was basically on his deathbed until he finally turned it around and was able to recover. He does recover, and his mom was also trying to find whatever way she could to provide for the family. She would end up remarrying three separate times, twice leaving um, because of abuse, whether at the hand of the husband or if it's the, the husband. One of his sons doesn't respect the new mother as his mother. There's a lot of tumult, a lot of turmoil. But when she remarries for the third time, uh, Dooku now has kind of the solid family unit that he's going to grow up under. When he's six years old, he now has some new stepbrothers. And what the stepbrothers like to do was take the new kid, Dooku, and take him into town and put him up for fights. In the words of Dooku's journal, in which he reflected on his life, one new brother used to drag me around, forcing me to fight with other village kids. The other kids enjoyed watching our fights, and I despise them even today for it. At the age of six, I was learning to fight. In those childhood days, I could see the red sun rising from the ocean's horizon. I planned my future while watching the sunrise and the bright sunlight. I always repeated to myself that I shall live to make it big. That was beautiful. However, at the risk of breaking the second rule of Fight Club, it does sound like he's breaking the first rule of Fight Club. He is talking about it, but I would also submit, it does, I do not believe he was a willing participant at this point. <laughs> So can you be held by the clauses of Fight Club if you do not willingly enter into such clauses? Maybe that's the third. To say. Maybe that's the third rule. Maybe they covered that and we just didn't keep reading. Uh, real quick, Diaz, here are the eight rules of Fight Club. The first rule of Fight Club is you do not talk about Fight Club. The second rule of Fight Club is you do not talk about Fight Club. Third rule of Fight Club, if someone yells stop, goes limp or taps out, the fight is over. Fourth rule, only two guys to a fight. Fifth rule, one fight at a time, fellas. Sixth rule, the fights are bare knuckle. No shirt, no shoes, no weapons. Seventh rule, fights will go on as long as they have to. And the eighth and final rule, if this is your first time at Fight Club, you have to fight. I honestly, no notes. I think it's great. You say stop, we stop. You don't say stop, we don't stop. (laughs) (laughs) But... Yeah, he, he kept this journal like throughout his life, which was remarkable. And it provides a lot of insight into what his upbringing was and kind of the life that he led. I mean, it was very much like when you're at that level of poverty as well, it is very much hunter-gatherer. He said we would catch scallop and fish. I would swim out far away to try to catch them. Uh, when autumn came, we would catch locusts to fry and eat them. In the winter, we'd go wild rabbit hunting. It's what you had to do to survive. Uh, And from ages 6 to 16, that's basically what it is for Dooku. Maybe his stepbrothers are dragging him into fight. If they're not, he's out trying to hunt for food to help guarantee the family's survival. When he gets to 18, decides to move out on his own. First, he's going to land in Sokcho, uh, which is about 120 miles west of Seoul. So going from the eastern coast to the western coast of Korea, And he works all kind of odd jobs there. Obviously, the odd job that anybody is able to kind of pick up and work, he's waiting tables. He's also selling pencils at one point. By the age of 18, he moves back into Seoul, uh, where he takes a job working at a steel mill. And after a couple of weeks of working there, uh, he confronts his boss because he still has gotten a paycheck. And the boss basically tells him to go fuck himself. Dooku says, go fuck yourself. Uh, storms out, but he has no money and he has no job. I mean, he could have beat the shit out of him, it sounds like. I'm, I guess it's good that he didn't get in trouble by doing that, but that's kind of where I thought you were right. going with it. Right. And, and then he and put his fight training to use. He does write in his journal that he regrets how angry he got in the meeting with the boss, but I don't know if that's like, why did I get angry and storm out of the job? Or why did I get angry and beat the shit out of him? And then he fired me. All we know is he got angry, then he doesn't have a job. So now, I mean, like he, he's left home. He hasn't been back home with his mother and his family there for a couple of years. And he's just truly on his own in Seoul. So he 
begs the bus driver to take him back into civilization at least so he has a fighting chance. Doesn't have any money for the toll, but the bus driver takes him in. And for the next week or so, uh, his life is very much a Red Hot Chili Pepper song. He's under the bridge downtown. He's living off crackers and pond water, and he's looking for work. Living off crackers and pond water is my favorite deep cut from theirs. That's exactly. That's what the song was really about. Some people think it was drugs. Eventually, he does find a job. Uh, He gets a job at a coffee shop where he's selling palm reading books for one cent a book. Pretty demeaning job. It's not a lot of pay, but most notably, it is pay. So Dooku takes it, and with this, you know, he's able to not make enough money that he's not worrying about where his next meal is going to come from or keeping a roof over his head. And with that lower base of Maslow's hierarchy of needs finally fulfilled, he's able to move on to some more recreational and professional pursuits, uh, namely boxing. At the age of 18, he enrolls at a gym in Seoul. Despite the experience of his fights as a six-year-old, uh, Dooku is not a natural at first. In fact, one time, the manager of the gym told him he didn't think he was giving enough of himself to the sport. And so he confided in his roommate, Bon St. Lee, who is also a boxer, uh, that he was considering suicide. But he knew that the opportunities in the gym were his best chance to get out of poverty. So he just kept working hard at it. It's all that he knew. By all accounts, Dooku was an intensely serious person um, in all of his pursuits. Whatever he was committing himself to, that's what he was all in on. Uh, As an example of the type of psychotic dedication that Dooku Kim had, he was a powerful believer in mantras. So he wrote several of them in his own journal. Uh, He also wrote the mantras in his own blood. And the most poignant of these to me at least, was poverty is my teacher. <laughs> I, I missed that chapter in The Secret. Through this level of psychotic dedication, he does eventually earn the respect of his trainers and they start putting him into some amateur fights. For his amateur and career in Korea, does pretty well. He racks up uh, 29 victories as compared to only four defeats. And while he's putting in work in the gym... He's also focused on looking upstairs at the tea shop that's going on up there because there is a beautiful young lady up there that has caught his eye. Getting back to what you brought up, Xavier, there's the Kims and then there's the Lees. We're now going to meet Young Mi Lee. Young Mi works in the tea shop. And as I said, immediately Dooku was smitten by her. But she was still at the point where, you know, she's not looking for anything serious. She's just trying to have fun. Here comes this guy with this very intense gaze that tells me that he's in love with me and that I'm going to be his wife. It's a little off-putting. It's not very charming. (laughs) He's probably writing that sentence somewhere in his blood repeatedly. If if he was doing it with those mantras, some way or another, he did finally break her down. Uh, One of the things that she brought up... (laughs) I don't think we want to... That's not a good way to phrase that because we do not want to endorse that kind of behavior because that's the James Bond 50 no's and a yes still means yes. And we do not endorse that. And, and that's what, this is why I'm going to be very specific. It's not anything like that. It's not Rocky telling Adrian not to leave the apartment. It's nothing like that. Um, God, that one of the things. Rough. Sorry, please. No, continue. It's, <laughs> no that, 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 that one is like, look, I love the film series. I love Rocky. That is one scene in particular. That it's, I'm like, the, it's the worst scene in the entire series. And there's a lot of bad uh, scenes in that series. Uh, just not great. Just not great. But no, what it finally was for Doko and Young Mi was Young Mi obviously had some reservations about him being a fighter. He said, look, I don't really know about this. My parents don't really know about this. I don't know if I can be with the fighter. And Doko, without missing a beat, says, what if I give up boxing? At first, she's like, yeah, right. But she can tell, again, as we said, Dulko is an extremely, intensely serious person. And she was like, oh, shit. Like, he really would give up boxing just to be with me. And she's smitten by this. uh, And so they start dating and going more seriously. While this is going on, Dulko is also ready to make the leap to the professional ranks. So at the age of 19, he turns pro. uh, Wins his first two fights on points. He loses the third. But across his next six fights, gets five victories in a draw, which earns him a chance to fight for the Korean national lightweight title. 
The fight goes the distance of 10 rounds. Uh, Duko is declared the victor afterwards, and he is now the Korean lightweight national champion. He defends this title four times before he gets a chance to step up and play for another title. Uh, this time it's going to be for the WBC's Oriental and Pacific Championship. So kind of just their title for all of Asia. It's not wonderfully named. It is yeah, the seven. Just, just to, okay, that's, yeah, there we go. I just want to check in on the time period as we're still saying Oriental. That's understandable. So late 70s, it's actually now 1982 when he fights. Okay. For this title, so again, Kyle still rookie year. Mm-hmm. exactly. Yes, <laughs> Kyle Ripken's rookie year. We didn't know that racism was bad yet. We didn't know that these words were offensive. So <laughs> it is the Oriental and Pacific Championship. Uh, this time, the distance does creep up a little bit. It's a twelve round fight now. It does go to distance, but Duko again claims the victory, and he is now the best lightweight in all of Asia, as recognized by the WBC. Fun fact, 1982 is also the year that actually uh, racism gets solved because that's when our boy Stevie Wonder, you know, having just finished naming Daryl Dawkins, puts out Ebony and Ivory with Paul McCartney. You just got to play that song, play that song and get everybody a pal to Pepsi and we can solve all the world's problems. After claiming the WBC title and asserting himself as the best lightweight in all of Asia, he defends that title four more times, all successfully, before he gets one more chance to step up onto a bigger stage and to fight for one of the greatest titles in the world. The WBA, after those four defenses, names Duku Kim as their number one contender to the lightweight title. And as such, they mandate the fight to happen in Las Vegas against Ray Boom Boom Mancini. Now, Boom Boom Mancini, as compared to the humble beginnings of Duku Kim, is as close to boxing royalty as we get. He's known as the good son. This is because he is the son of Lenny Mancini, who was a renowned contender in the late 30s, early 40s. Then he got called over to fight in Europe because of that whole Hitler thing. Um, Wins that fight, uh, but he does suffer a couple wounds while over in combat. When he comes back, he is still able to fight, but he's no longer on an elite level. He's not really able to fight for titles at that point. So Ray Mancini has this as his backstory. He's also just young. You know, he's got the pretty face. He's got the the charisma, very humble while also being energetic. And most importantly, in the ring, he has an aggressive style. He's not one to sit back and counterpunch. He's going to come forward. He's going to bring the fight to his opponent. And that makes him a fan favorite. Uh, As we're set for this title fight with Duku Kim, Mancini is only 21 years old, but he's already fought 25 times professionally. He's 24 and 1, 20 knockouts, and uh, he's looking to successfully defend his WBA title. Duku knew that this was the opportunity of a lifetime being presented to him. He started to make a modest fortune fighting in Asia, but now he has a chance to go into the United States to go into Las Vegas with all of its bright lights. And if he can win this fight, even if he doesn't win this fight, his family, he's set to earn 50000 for this fight. And that's pre-inflation. So with inflation, we're probably talking 200000 something like that. And when we consider, again, where he's coming from in Korea, this is certainly a life-changing fortune that he's earning just by getting to come over in this fight. But if he can somehow find a way to win it, you know, it becomes generational wealth for his family. So he has to train hard, not only because of the enormity of this opportunity, but also because the fight itself is going to be different than any fight that he's ever had before. Fighting in Asia, the longest that Duku had ever fought was a 12-round fight. He had fought in those twice. For a world championship fight at this time, the standard is for the fight to go 15 rounds. Ray Mancini had fought in three such fights. Only one of them actually went further than 12 uh, which was when he was TKO'd by Alexis Arguello, which was his only loss. But nonetheless, Mancini had at least trained three times previously for that gauntlet, whereas this is the first time that Duke Kim is preparing for this kind of environment. So it's not just a more intense physical training. Uh, it's also, from a mental standpoint, he's going to push himself to levels that he's never been before. Again, has his mantras that he continues to write. Posted up throughout his gym in Seoul. 
uh, mantras such as I will knock out Mancini and I will be champion. One day he showed up to training with a coffin. And when his team asked him, what's this for? He said, one of us is going in this. Less weird than writing in blood. I'm sorry. That's the, what? like the, the right. Yeah. I'm not going to get over him writing shit down in his own. Put the two together, write the mantra in blood on the coffin. And I just want to, it's not like the whole journal is in his blood. It's just the mantras. Oh, I'm sorry. It's just, a, he's only writing with a little <laughs> bit of his blood. Just a that little bit everything. of blood. Just, just a little bit of blood, Stan. Tell, tell your mom it's okay. Just a little bit of blood. <laughs> but yes, I mean, he's, he has all these mantras, but the most ominous one is the one that he would write when he got to his hotel room in America. Uh, and when he wrote on the lampshade, live or die. I mean, those are the two no. states of being. So, you know, I, I do get that one. No, I mean, it just, and it just illustrates the, the lengths to which he was prepared to go to change not only his fortune, but his family's fortune and, you know, in recognition of the opportunity that he had here. When he landed in America, he did so without Young Me, partially because she never watched his fights out of superstition. Um, but also when he left Korea, he left with the knowledge that Young Me was pregnant. Uh, he was going to be a father. Young Me was about two months pregnant at the time that Dooku left Korea to go to America for the fight. Once they get to America, his team realizes pretty quickly that making weight is going to be an issue. They went too hard with training. He packed on a little too much muscle. So getting back down to that 135 limit is going to be tough. So basically, they start a rigorous campaign where the goal is really just get every fucking ounce of water out of this guy's body. Get him dehydrated as fuck. We need him to weigh in under 135. Sure enough, weighs in at exactly 135 at weigh-in, which is 24 hours before the fight. So with the last detail settled, everything's clear. Uh, he's going to fight for the world title outside of the Caesars Palace in Las Vegas. Super uh, impressive for them to get every ounce of water out because they also had to learn what ounces were when they came here. That's true. Yeah, it might have been milliliters they were working in. So the conversion rate could have taken a little bit. Because well, they um, have to get but, to 135 pounds. That's what I'm saying. The conversion threw off the whole thing. It's, it's, it's a whole lot of factors going in there. It was high um, quality cutting. High quality cutting. Just make him as desiccated as possible. Full on mummy. Right. I mean, and this is like, it is a common practice in boxing at the time, too. I do want to, I want to make that clear. Like, it, it isn't like they came up with this crazy thing. Like, what if we just make him very sick? Yeah. Like, it is a common thing uh, in boxing. The, the other kind of common perception around this fight is that Dooku is, he's not quite Peter Buckley, but he's closer to Peter Buckley than he is to like a Vander Holyfield. What I mean to say it is he's a solid fighter. It's a good fight to keep Mancini busy, but this fight was very much made with the intention of Mancini's going to win. And then the night before, Aaron Pryor and Alexis Arguello fought. And the idea was that the winner of that fight would then fight Mancini for a title unification bout. And this is just a fight to keep Mancini active, basically. Quickly, when the fight starts, it's obvious that Dooku's not playing along with this script. Mancini's used to being the aggressor in his fights. Dooku comes out and to hear his corner talk about their strategy was, if we let him be aggressive, then he's fighting his fight. We need to be the aggressor and put him on his back foot. And he's very successful early in the fight. Um, around round six, he lands a three-punch combo on Mancini and does the Ali shuffle in the ring. Like, puts his hands up, does a little one-two thing. Like, he's, he's playing into the crowd, which is obviously a very pro-American crowd. Very anti-Korean and Dooku. But, you know, he's using it as motivation. And he's really bringing the fight to Mancini for the first portion. After the 10th round, Mancini says he went back to his corner and it was the first and only time in his fighting career that he actually considered quitting on the stool because Dooku looked like he was not slowing down at all. Mancini's right eye is almost swollen shut at this point. And, you know, Dooku's taking punishment too, but seemingly unfazed by any of it and just keeps coming forward. But Mancini doesn't quit. He pushes through. Next two rounds starting to turn in his favor a little bit. And now we're entering those championship rounds that everybody talks about in boxing. And kind of right from the start of round 13, it's already clear that 
Mancini is used to this and Dooku is not. Mancini comes out far the aggressor. At one point, he lands 30 consecutive punches uninterrupted on Dooku. But right as you're thinking, oh, he's in trouble. The ref needs to step in and do something. Dooku comes back with a combination of his own. Still fighting back with tremendous spirit. And he does make it through the end of the round to the end of the 13th. But it's clear that he's in trouble at this point. 14th round starts. Mancini leaps off his stool. Kind of just charges right at Kim. And with a right straight, he finally knocks him back. And uh, for the first time in the fight, a fighter is down. Dooku Kim gets knocked down. Kind of slams his head against the back of the canvas when he falls. But somehow, some way, desperately gets back to all fours. He's pulling at the rope to pull himself up. And he does beat the count. He gets up at nine. But the second he tries to stand without assistance from the ropes, it's very clear he's out on his feet. So referee Richard Green makes the right call, calls a stop to the action, 19 seconds in the round 14. Mancini, obviously, immediately celebratory with his corner. Kim's led back to his corner, and the situation pretty swiftly deteriorates. Within seconds, he's struggling to keep his balance on the stool. Shortly after that, he falls over entirely and doesn't have control of any of his motor function. So they put him on a stretcher, and... As he's being rushed out by his team, Ray Mancini's given the post-fight interview, and he is nothing but deferential and complimentary of Kim. He's saying, look, I know you media guys were expecting this to be an easy fight. You thought this was some no-name guy from Korea, but I watched his fights. I knew what I was getting into. I'm not surprised by the fight that he showed today. He's a tremendous competitor. All the glowing things that you would ever hope for a boxer to say about one of their opponents. The last image shown on the broadcast of Kim is him being carried out on the stretcher by his team. And, you know, basically they go off air saying, we'll keep you posted. Hope for the best for Dooku. Very quickly, it's apparent that it's not going very well for Dooku. He's rushed to the Desert Springs Hospital. En route to the hospital, he slips into a coma. And he's found to have suffered a subdural hematoma. I didn't know what that means, but that basically means bleeding on the brain. And it was 100 milliliters of blood was found inside his head. They perform an emergency brain surgery on him to relieve the pressure and to drain that blood. And while Youngmi stays in Korea, Dooku's mom and his half-brother have flown in from Korea. And uh, they bring their own team of Eastern medicine practitioners. So, you know, there's herbal medicine being tried. There's acupuncture being tried. And... While he's being kept on life support, the family does this for about four or five days. Um, And then finally, one of the acupuncturists turned to his mom and said, he belongs with the dead. With that being determined by the acupuncturist, the life support was removed. And shortly thereafter, on November 18th, 1982, five days after the fight, Dooku Kim succumbed to his injuries. The after effects of this fight cannot be understated. And I'm not going to build up to him. I'm just going to say him. First of all, Ray Mancini, celebrated champion at the time of this, but never got around to that unification fight with Aaron Pryor. Uh, He took time away from the sport after that, kind of just dealing with the trauma of the event on himself. He would defend his title successfully twice uh, before he would lose consecutive fights to Livingston Bramble. Um, That's at the age of 23. He then takes four years off from fighting before he comes back to fight Hector Camacho. He loses the decision to him. And then three years after that, he loses to Greg Haugen via knockout to conclude his professional career. After fighting 25 times from the age of 18 to 22, or 21, excuse me, he would fight just four more times by the age of 30 before he ultimately retired. Any boxing historian will tell you, Even in those four fights that he did fight afterwards, Mancini was never the same um, after that fight with Dooku Kim. Dooku Kim's mom, three months later, died of suicide back in South Korea. The referee, Richard Green, would referee a couple more fights, but almost a year after the fight would also die of suicide. So this was a fight that had profound impacts on just about everybody who was involved with it, whether it was the fighters in the ring, the referee in the ring, the families of the fighters in the ring. Disastrous effects after this fight. 
And it is the kind of fight that causes a sport to look itself in the eye and say, what are we doing here? When you've got a fight between two people that results in three deaths, essentially, that is some very bleak math that you need to address. And it's not even just the aftermath of the Dooku Kim fight. There's also the fact that that Arguello prior fight that I mentioned that happened the night before Alexis Arguello was knocked out unconscious in that fight. Very scary scenes there until Arguello did finally come back earlier in that year. Uh, if you are a dedicated listener of the podcast, you'll remember Tex Cobb when he fought Larry Holmes. He got the ever living shit beat out of him to the point that Howard Cassell said, I'm done with boxing. So those two, the, the prior Arguello fight and the Tex Cobb, Larry Holmes fight or both earlier in the year, kind of got the conversation started. And then when this tragedy happens with Dooku Kim, it's now time for boxing to really have a reckoning with itself. Most notably, Bob Arum, who is somehow still kicking around promoting fights, but he was the promoter for that fight. And he called for a halt to the sport until commissions could be formed to figure out a way to make boxing more safe. And after many panels and commissions and discussions, the two main changes that were settled on was, first of all, to eliminate the final three rounds of a championship bout to make a 12-round fight be the longest that there is. The secondary is that as opposed to the only medical qualification being for the fight, did you make the weight? Um, they're also going to be checking in with fighters throughout their camps to make sure hydration levels are where they need to be, um, potassium levels, you know, all, all the different blood work that you can do to ensure that a person is safely and effectively training, this becomes much more commonplace following Dooku Kim's death. So it is unfortunate that those regulations had to result from the death of Dooku Kim, but to hopefully put a little bit of a happy ending on this as much as I can. The respect between the Mancini and the Kim families is something that I think is beautiful and is one of the things that does make boxing such a beautiful sport. Mancini attended Dooku's funeral in Korea. He was warmly welcomed by the Kim family and by Korean nationals. And the family essentially said to him, Dooku Kim's spirit lives on through you. He, he was also explicitly saying like one of the two of them was going to die leading into it. Dooku was, exactly. So yeah. I think from that perspective as well, like that's obviously no secret to the family. They family know. Said, we were going to a funeral. Right. One, one or the other. One or the other. And like what Mancini always says to about Dooku Kim is like, look, if you, if, you, if you get in the ring with somebody, I don't care if I never met him before. When we're sharing that ring together, I know that man better than I know myself. And he knows me better than I know myself. Because you're, you're staring into the soul of somebody as you are both fighting literally life and death. Mancini, you know, still says nothing but referential things about Dooku says he was a true warrior. And one thing that was very touching for me, in 2011, Mancini had the chance to meet Young Me again, obviously met her at Dooku's funeral. But he did get to meet for the first time Jiwon Kim, who is Dooku's son. Jiwon was also a very intense athlete growing up. When he was growing up, his mom would first say to him, oh, your father went on a plane to the United States. And she would just leave it at that. Technically true, not mentioning the he died part. And, you know, he was a very intense athlete. And at one point he said, Mom, like, I want to I want to start boxing. And that led to her breaking down and finally coming out with the truth to him. I think he was about 10 at that time. So Jiwon never got into boxing, but he did become a very successful dentist in Seoul. It is a tragic yet beautiful irony that in giving his life in that fight Dooku Kim did secure the fortune that was able to change his family's life and to lead to the education that then allows Jiwon to become a dentist and to not have to resort to the kind of things that he had to to be able to survive if you want to see more about that meeting between Jiwon and Young Mi and Ray Mancini again that is heavily featured in a documentary that was made about Ray Mancini. That's called The Good Son, The Life of Ray Mancini. You can find that on YouTube. Basically, the entire back half of the documentary is just about the Dooku Kim fight. It features interviews with Young Mi's family, with Ji Wan. Very good documentary to get some insights. 
There's also been two Korean films uh, which are made on the basis of Dooku's life. The first is called The Tiger Who Does Not Cry, produced immediately after his death, and it aired for 15 consecutive days on state TV in Seoul. You're going to watch this and you're going to like it for two weeks. Two weeks of national mourning when he passed away. So, you know, they, they, they do a week when some fucking dictator dies up north, but down south, they honor their boxers. There was a second film that was made about the life of Duke Kuo Kim. This came out in 2002. Uh, it is simply called Champion. You can find it on YouTube or Prime. Uh, what you can't find with it, though, is subtitles. The beginning sequence is in English because it's they do uh, the end media ray thing where they start with the fight, and then right when the first punch is thrown, they flash all the way back. We tell his whole life story, and then we go back up to the fight. The fight's in English. All the middle stuff is in Korean. So I did watch that whole film not knowing a single word of Korean. But it does paint a beautiful picture of Dooku rising up from poverty, being very persistent with young me and young me kind of thinking, who's this fucking idiot at first? Um, I don't speak Korean, but I do think she did say at one point, this fucking idiot. It was was about a two hour film. I thought it was very well made. The cinematography in it is excellent. And although I may not understand what they are saying, I do appreciate the film. I do appreciate the telling of Dooku's story and... To end my iteration of Dooku's story, I thought I would just end it with an entry from his journal, him talking about himself, and he wrote this before he ever claimed any of his professional titles. I know I cannot afford to be lazy. I must create something in order to realize my great dream. In order to do that, I must reach the top. A country boy named Kim Dooku will show the world something. I shall run and fight until I am covered with blood and sweat. And And I will write... Another page in that blood with and the, sweat. With the blood and sweat. But however long or however short uh, a life ends up being, I think the hallmark of a life well lived is one in which you set your intentions and then you live by those intentions. And obviously, it is a tremendous tragedy that Duke Kim passed away so young, really his whole life ahead of him, about to start his family about to move into the new house about to realize his new fortune but you know through his sacrifice the sport of boxing is a lot safer now boxing still has a ways to go to be safe and to to truly protect all of its fighters but if there's one name in the history of boxing that gets overlooked underappreciated and you know one of the truly great warriors of the sport and Dare I submit one of the guys of the sport, Dooku Kim. There's nothing just, witty or funny that you fixa- can say to segue death. <laughs> yeah, well, no. And, and like, despite my fixation on the blood writing, like, it's a good story. It is a tale written in blood by him and then also by his own blood. <laughs> it is. Yeah, I, no, it's tough, but it is like, wish it didn't come to that. He was fully prepared to leave his life in that ring if that was what it took. Um, he was also fully did. prepared to murder the other guy. They, he was very deferential and respectful, like in the press conference sure. and everything. Like, I want to be sure. clear of that. And like, and, and that's he had like, a coffin that he said was for one of them. He did. He did. But I, I think that's like that's part of what makes boxers so special is like that you're able to go to that dark place and yet still retain your humanity when you aren't in the ring. He's not a boxer, but like Brian Dawkins was kind of like that, where like he is like the most down to earth Christian pastor, humble guy off the field. But when he turns into Weapon X, he is a completely different person. And like that's just one of those things about athletes that is just like so fascinating to me that you can segment your life like that. Well, that's what makes those guys special. I'll tell you what makes the next guy we're going to hear about special, and that is that. It's Xavier who's bringing it to us, and I know it's going to be a bang. And hopefully there's slightly less death than in Diaz's. You have to get under three, under three direct deaths. and there's. I can, I can confirm there are under three deaths in, in, this, we in, go, this, baby. in this talk. I'm very, I was very excited about this topic that James chose. And, you know, we had been talking off air about the need for more hockey representation And there is a guy that fits this category to a T from the hockey world. 
And so today I want to talk about Roger Nielsen. Roger was born June 16th, 1934 in Toronto, Canada. Growing up in Canada, as you might expect, Roger is surrounded by hockey. And he loved hockey. But he was more of the academic type and not the playing it type. So he did not play hockey professionally. He did not play it at a junior level. Instead, he went to college. He went to make Master University in Hamilton, which is one of the best colleges in all of Canada, where he studied physical education with a concentration in hockey and baseball. And the you might... baseball is interesting. What year is this that he's learning baseball in Canada? So this is in the 50s. And so you might question, you know, all right, what is he going to do with this? Well, he becomes a phys ed teacher. And for the next decade after graduating from college, he is just a phys ed teacher in high schools in the Toronto area while on the side working as an assistant coach for peewee teams, bantam teams, and kind of working his way up the side of like all of these minor and like youth hockey leagues until eventually in the 60s he gets a chance to be the head coach of the Peterborough Peets which was then an OHL farm team for the Canadians he stays in Peterborough for almost a decade he wins one championship but now 1976 now in his 40s he finally gets a chance to coach professional hockey so he moves to Dallas, where he coaches the Dallas Blackhawks of the Central Hockey League. Just to clarify, I assume he's not also a PE teacher still at this point. No, at this point, he is not a PE teacher. He was a PE teacher until he became the Peterborough Peets head coach, although he is still very much an educator, so he did teach when he had time, like, as an adjunct. Uh, Like, like, there is, like, a school named after Roger Nielsen because of his commitment to education. So he spends one year in Dallas with the Blackhawks. And then he finally gets his shot in the NHL, taking over his hometown Maple Leafs. In a very weird situation, Roger first finds out that he has the Maple Leafs coaching job reading a newspaper at a library in Austria in the summer of 1977. Presumably, he had at least interviewed for it, right? Yes. Like, he knew he was so, in the running. So, he had interviewed with GM Jim Gregory, but he had never met owner Harold Ballard. But in he's reading in this newspaper that Ballard told reporters Nielsen had called him from South Africa to accept the job. Nielsen, who was just coming back from North Africa, had never been to South Africa and had never talked to Ballard in his life. But he did want the job, so he did, like, say, hey, I, I do want to do this. I don't know, it, like, who you talked to, but it was not me. Nonetheless, his first season in Toronto is very successful. They win eight more games than they did the previous season, and they make it all the way to the conference semifinals before being swept by the eventual champion Canadiens. His second season, still a playoff year, but not as successful, and it's marred by... a. Uh, one of the weirder owner antics in any sports history. In March of 1979, the Leafs were on a four-game losing streak, and they were playing defending champs Montreal. They played well, but they lost 2-1 to for their fifth straight loss. After the game, Ballard went on live TV and fired Nielsen. But he didn't tell Nielsen, and he had no one lined up to replace him. So on the flight home, Jim Gregory had to tell Nielsen that he was fired. And Nielsen, wanting to talk to Ballard, showed up to work anyway the next day, hoping to talk to him. And he's there all day, doesn't see Ballard. He's like, all right, I guess I'll just pack up my stuff and leave. Meanwhile, Ballard had been calling people all night, but no one wanted the job. So when Nielsen's leaving with all his stuff, he finds Ballard stretched out on a bench, having his toenails clipped by Leafs trainer Guy Kinnear and Guy Kinnear? Is, is, it, is it Guy no, Kinnear? No, it's almost really pronounced Guy, but I just wanted to draw attention. To yes, it. yes. There's a guy sighting. So they have a very awkward conversation, as you might expect, uh, with the guy who just fired you and who is now getting their toenails clipped for them. And then Ballard asks Neil said what he had planned for the weekend. 
Nielsen said he had been invited to be uh, a color analyst guest on radio for that Saturday's home game against the Flyers. And Ballard said, well, don't go too far away. Confused, Nielsen leaves. And on Saturday morning, players running the morning skate by themselves. And they're just really pissed. They're like, what the fuck is going on? So a small group of senior players go to Ballard and like say, hey, we, we need something. You either have to bring back Nielsen or you have to give us a reason why you let him go and you have an actual coach coming. So with the mounting pressure, Ballard had an idea. Quote, game time was coming up and Harold came out of his office in his bathrobe, said Gord Stellick, a Leafs assistant. That's what I heard. This guy's him... fucking weird. I'm yes, sorry. He's very weird. He's very weird. Uh, that's when I heard him tell Gregory he wanted Roger to wear the bag. No one would be standing behind our bench until just before puck drop. Then Roger would come out wearing the bag and pull it off or have someone do it at the last second. What bag, you may ask? Ballard wanted Nielsen to wear a paper bag on his head as a mystery coach and then do an unveiling to make the whole firing look like it was staged to make Ballard not look like shit. So at first I thought this was like some Steinbrenner, Billy Martin, lovers turned enemies constantly back and forth sitcom bullshit. But now this is someone who just like clearly wishes so deeply that they were Bill Beck. Like this guy just wants to be (laughs) a fucking cool loose cannon owner who can do whatever shit he wants and play it off as a bit. And he's, you know, you can't try to be Bill Beck and it's a little sad. So Ballard started yelling he better wear the fucking bag or he won't coach. What uh, and Nielsen said, fuck that, and showed up without the bag and got a standing ovation from the home fans, totally showing up Ballard. The team then won five straight games, went on to sweep the Atlanta Flames in the first round of the playoffs before falling to the Canadians again. After the season had ended, Ballard, pretty humiliated at this point, did then fire Nielsen again for real, and he quickly moved to Buffalo, where he spent one year as an assistant, and then one year as the head coach, winning the Adam Division title, putting up 99 points, one of the best seasons in Buffalo history, before he then got fired because him and GM Scotty Bowman did not get along. So this is twice where his success has kind of not helped him due to the people above him. But after that, he moves to Vancouver, where he is assistant coach with the Canucks. Until head coach Harry Neal gets suspended for an altercation with Nordiques fans in Quebec City, and they make Nielsen the interim head coach. They go unbeaten for the rest of the season, and then the first round of the playoffs, they sweep Calgary. So they just give Roger the job permanently, and Neal becomes the GM, because they were apparently thinking about doing that anyway. Next round, gentlemen sweep against the Kings 4-1. Then they get to the conference finals against Chicago. They win the first game in Chicago 2-1 in double overtime. Game two, they fall behind 3-1. And they felt that, you know, there was a lot of questionable calls against them. You know, they had a goal disallowed. There was a perceived non-call against Chicago. Four consecutive penalties against the Canucks. On the power play, Dennis Savard scores to put the Blackhawks up 4-1. And the Canucks are just, they're, they're done. They, they're frustrated. They, they're pissed off at this game. So assistant coach Ron Smith yells out, we give up, we surrender, we give up. And he suggests to Nielsen that they throw sticks onto the ice in protest. Nielsen says, ah, I've done that before. It, it's not as fun. So I have a better idea. So he takes a white towel, puts it on a stick, holds it up in mock surrender along with a couple other Vancouver Canucks players. They all get ejected from the game, and they lose that game 4-1, but Vancouver goaltender Richard Brodeur later noted that although they lost, the atmosphere in the, in the dressing room was so positive, it was as if they had won. I love the Vancouver Canucks. I just want to say, like, it's so fucking appropriate that like one of their most beloved stories is when they made a giant show out of giving up. Nielsen gets fined $1,000. The franchise gets fined $10,000. They called his actions Bush League. And NHL Executive Vice President Brian Neal stated that disgraced the championship series. But that wasn't going to stop Vancouver. Because when they got home, they were greeted by fans at the airport waving towels in support of the team. 
Former professional football player, wrestler, and five-time world belly flop champion, Butts Giroux, got permission from the team to start selling towels with the phrase, Canucks take no survivors. He sold 30,000 of these towels and raised over $23,000 for charity. Quote, when we went out for the start of game three, all you could see was a sea of white towels. Even talking about it now, I still get goosebumps. It was like, oh my God, it was a great feeling. It was a good boost for us. Towel power helped galvanize Vancouver and the fans. It brought us together as a province and as a team. We weren't expected to be competing for a Stanley Cup, so it was us against the world, and those towels were the symbol of that. This is Stan Smeal, former Canucks captain. With a riled-up home crowd, Vancouver wins the next two games before completing the gentleman's sweep in Game 5 in Chicago, thanks to towel power. They do, unfortunately, then lose to that ridiculous Islanders mid-'80s team in the Stanley Cup Finals. And Roger coaches a couple more seasons for Vancouver before Neil pulls a Greg Popovich and fires Roger and places him with himself. It's a little less insane than Greg Popovich. I'm going to say Greg Popovich is still more unhinged for doing his (laughs) because to be fair to Gary Neal, he had also been the coach who then got supplanted by Nielsen. So like there's a little bit of back and forth there that makes it less insane than Greg Popovich literally firing the coach that he hired so that he can make himself the coach. That's true, but it's too funny not to call that a Popovich at this point. After a short season with the Kings, he moves to Edmonton as a video analyst and then as assistant for Chicago and then as a color commentator for TSN. But then the, the Rangers lure him back to coaching in 1989, and in four seasons, he wins two division titles. He's really successful with the Rangers, but they just can't kick over the hump. So he moves to Florida and becomes the first coach in Panthers history. Back then, expansion teams, absolute garbage. Had never made the playoffs or had anything like a successful season. And in those first two years, they missed the playoffs by one point both years. It's a great coaching job, but Florida does decide they want to go a different direction. So he goes to the Flyers, and he is the coach of the Flyers for a couple seasons. He is the first Flyers coach that I remember. And then there was the 1999-2000 season for the Flyers, which was maybe the craziest season or one of the craziest seasons of Flyers history. There was the promising young defender who died in a boating accident before the season started. There was Eric Lindros getting concussions and then getting stripped of captaincy for concussions. And then there was Roger getting diagnosed with bone cancer and having to step down with assistant coach Craig Ramsey taking over. But after getting treatment, he tries to come back. But the GM, uh, Bobby Clark, says, actually, we don't want you anymore. Ramsey's going to be our permanent coach. And when trying to defend himself to the media, he said, quote, Roger got cancer. That wasn't our fault. We didn't tell him to go get cancer. It's too bad that he did. We feel sorry for him. But then he went goofy on us. It's too bad that he did. Talking about your coach, you're like, yeah, we didn't tell him to get cancer. It's too bad. But, you know, what are we going to do about it? I Not mean, fire listen, him? Listen, Bobby Clark is many things. He's a two-time Stanley Cup champion. He's a winner of the Super Series against Russia. He's also a noted asshole. Yeah, it, not, it was not good. But, you know, he does then get hired by the Ottawa Senators as assistant coach. And they let him coach two games because that takes him to 1,000 games coached for his career. And it was a really great, like, seeing him getting that milestone. Fortunately, that is the last coaching he will do because by this point, the bone cancer had spread and turned into skin cancer uh, and was incurable. And unfortunately... He does die on June 21st, 2003, just five days after his 69th birthday. But I, I'm sorry, it's somber, but real quick, nice. I was wondering if you were going to do that. I wasn't sure if it was going to happen, but, you know, I, I guess it's it is necessary. It's an obligation, Xavier. Exactly. It's an obligation. You know, so far, I've really only talked about his career as a whole. And although it's very interesting, in my opinion, you might be asking, so where does the being responsible for rules part come in? So... Roger Nielsen is really known for his dedication to his craft and to knowing everything about hockey. This led to multiple major innovations in the sport. First, 
Roger is the first coach to ever make use of video to watch and analyze other teams and was given the nickname Captain Video, which he absolutely hated. He got this idea when he was coaching the Peets when he watched the videotape of a just played game on like a video cassette recorder, which were just becoming a thing at the time. Quote, we used to sneak the equipment out of the high school. I thought it would be a good idea to watch the game again. We wanted to analyze it. So then we came up with the idea of counting the scoring chances to determine how it went. Shots on goal could be misleading. And he's right. He ends up being one of the first, if not the first person to get into early analytics for hockey, tracking things like face-offs, high danger chances. And along with that, he was also one of the first to get teams to actually train in the off season. Like hockey players would just go and drink beers and chill and not do anything in the off season. And he was like, Hey, maybe we should like work out or exercise or stay in shape. Former Maple Leafs forward, Daryl Sittler said all that had to start somewhere. We were packed in a little room under the stands of the guards. When he showed up those first videos on a basic TV going over power plays and penalty killing, it was new, but refreshing. And I was all for it. Roger also introduced us to proper off ice conditioning got us working on face-off plays, and he probably came up with the first defined chart of scoring chances. Mostly, he made you accountable to be prepared for every night like it was Game 7 of the Stanley Cup Final. So, he's revolutionizing hockey. But the other big thing he's known for is his ability to exploit loopholes in the rule book, like the biggest troll in hockey history. There are three different rules in the NHL rulebook that were made because of Roger Nielsen's trolling. The first of these incidents came during a game in his first season coaching the Peets. The thing to remember is that they're all operating under NHL rules, even if it's minor league hockey. He was down two men in a five-on-three situation in the last minute of the game. And he realized that more penalties could not be served under the, under the existing rules. So every 10 seconds... He intentionally put another man on the ice to get too many men on the ice penalties to completely break up any flow the team on the power play could have to try to score, to tie it, or win it. He just sent someone out, and the refs would stop it, and then have to reset, but they couldn't give a penalty because they couldn't take another person off because you have to have at least three players on the ice. He also encouraged fans to throw things on the ice for more delay of games that could not change it being five on three. So the NHL seeing this was like, this is bad. We don't, we don't like this happening. So now there is rule 74.4. Too many men deliberate illegal substitution. If by reason of insufficient playing time remaining, or by reason of penalties already imposed, a bench minor penalty is imposed for deliberate illegal substitution. If it cannot be served within the legal playing time, a penalty shot shall be awarded against the offending team. Essentially say, hey, if you do this again, we're giving penalty shots. You can't just keep delaying the game because you know that we can't take another person off the ice. But he also had a solution for that. Nielsen discovered that if you put a defenseman in net instead of a goaltender during a penalty shot, the defenseman can just rush out of the net and poke the puck away before the attacker had any chance to actually shoot. He did this six times. And it worked every single time. After the first time, the referee-in-chief of the NHL, Scotty Morrison, said there was nothing in the rulebook against it, but that it should be covered, quote, if only because somebody is making a farce of the game. But Roger did it as long as he was allowed, and it worked every single time. They changed that rule after the season was over. So now Rule 24.2, Penalty Shot Procedures. Only a player designated as a goalkeeper or alternate goalkeeper may defend against a penalty shot. The goalkeeper must remain in his crease until the player taking a penalty shot has touched the puck. So this is the second time his trolling has led to a new rule. But my favorite loophole that Nielsen exploited was in regard to pulling a goalie for an extra attacker. So in one game, he told his goalie, when we pull you, just leave your goal stick lying in the crease. When the other team got possession, they sent the puck the length of the ice towards the open net only for it to deflect when it hit the stick lying across the entire goal. The NHL really didn't like that one. And they wanted to make sure that he couldn't exploit this in any way. So now there is rule 67.5, awarded goal. 
when a goalkeeper, prior to proceeding to his player's bench to replace by an extra attacker, intentionally leaves his stick or other piece of equipment, piles snow or other obstacles at or near his net, <laughs> in the opinion of the referee would tend to prevent the puck from entering the net, a goal shall be awarded. <laughs> They're like, we don't want him to just say, sticks, okay, then put your mask down. Oh no, kick up a bunch of snow to block the puck. Yeah, we're trying to like hedge our bets against some things we anticipate him trying next. And as much of a troll as he was, the NHL actually like really appreciated the way there's a really good like short video on Roger from Secret Base that I highly recommend where they compared him to a white hat hacker who's hired to like find vulnerabilities in a company's security protocols. They also say like he saved hockey by pushing their rules to limits in the same way that the NBA had to implement the shot clock because of teams exploiting it to just pass the ball around and not do anything to make the sport better. And I love that idea of Roger changing the game through video, through conditioning, and also by just knowing the rules better than everyone else to the point where he could troll the actual officials to win games and the NHL has it. Okay, yep, we got to fix that. We got to fix that. We got to fix that. And thanks to all of Rogers' incredible pushing and prodding of the rules, he was inducted into the Hall of Fame under the Builders category. Well, brick and mortar. Hmm. Is that going to preclude him over here, though? Now, no, because that's the thing that I think is the most important: is that coaches in the NHL, it's essentially a requirement that they get one or two Stanley Cups to be inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame. Roger is the exception to this because of his rule bending and his just general knowledge of the game being so far greater than everyone else. And also just everyone loved him. Like they called him like the uncle of the NHL. Like people would just bring their kids and grandkids over to his house and just hang out. I I really like Roger because I like the idea of just a guy who was a gym teacher well into his thirties being like, yeah, I like doing this. I'm just going to do this and see what happens and just mess around with the rules because I'm just going to know everything better than everyone else and see how far I can take things. He has memorable moments in Rangers history and Canucks history to the point where there's a statue of him outside of the, of Rogers arena holding the hockey stick with the towel over it, like creating a tradition that still it, happens. It's called towel power. The statue is yeah. called towel power. It's towel power, which is also a phenomenal phrase. And for giving us these three hilarious rules as a result of his trolling of the rule books and towel power, video analyzing, and everything else, I just really like Roger Nielsen. Well, and shouts to him for helping make the holy trinity of combined Rangers, Canucks, Flyers coaches. Along yeah, we don't get a lot of those. We have, we have three. Him, Alain Alain Vigneault. Vigneault. Yeah. But those are his three yeah. rules, and those are our three guys. The first thing that comes to mind when I'm trying to separate these, because this is not an easy one, is we do have two instances where we have rules that we like. We've got, hey, these are in place to keep people from dying. And hey, these are fundamentally here in hockey to make it an... I'm going to argue with the having defensemen as a goalie for shootouts. I think that'd be fun. The other two, I get it. Whereas the rules that are made because of Daryl Dawkins, actively not fun. Safe? Maybe. But actively not fun. So we don't like those rules. I think the NBA went the wrong direction with that. Like, it should be 20 points if you break a backboard. I don't want this like desperate fouling bullshit at the end of the game. I want your biggest, strongest motherfucker going in and trying to make up this 15 point deficit by shattering the backboard. Okay. Okay. Here is my proposal. And I'm going to admit it's coming from the worst sport ever created by a human being. And also from a very bad person. Cause this is an idea based on Quidditch, but what if breaking the backboard is the snitch? What if breaking the backboard, you get 20 points, the game's immediately over. Maybe you lost. Maybe you're down by 40 and you get really mad so you just go smash a backboard to end it. Or it is just the capper to a perfect ending. I gotta say, I don't like it. I, I, I mean, I, I, I love the idea of a team being outside of the margin of the snitch slash broken backboard. 
and just going, what's what's the fucker Victor Crumb? Just pull a Victor Crumb, be like, you know what? Fuck you guys. The backboard's broken. We lose. Get the fuck out of here. Okay, that's as much Harry Potter as we're allowed to do this year. We hit our quota. Um, I think of the three of these, like Daryl Dawkins is the most guy piece. We're just going like guy per pound. That's unquestionable. But I lean towards the other two as fitting the category better. See, it's, it's you know I like Roger here. Nielsen, and I do like Diaz as guy. It just I don't know. It made it made me sad, and I, I find it hard to judge fairly when oh yeah, he died, and then his mom killed herself, and then the ref killed himself, and I'm like, I don't want to think about this anymore. Well, which is unfair. It, it's unfair, but no, I mean it, it's certainly harrowing, and trust me, I like when I bring up guys that I can make silly, fun jokes about the whole time, and not guys that literally gave their life for their family and for their sport. But I do think we have like at least a somewhat funny angle with the blood writing. I'm obsessed. It's more with creepy. It's more creepy I'm obsessed than with funny. Blood writing. I mean, look, here's the thing. It's a very thin line when you're doing blood writing, right? Writing mm-hmm. mantras to yourself, crazy but acceptable. If he Is wrote it? love letters to it, it, listen, if he wrote love letters to young me in his blood, that's over the line. That's where I think the line is. Letters well, to self, a really, good. a really close line. Listen, here's letters to self, good. Letters to others, bad. So I was blown away. I, I looked through his page to make sure I got the spelling right of Gimdoku, and I was blown away to find, just scrolling through the page real quick, that apparently he was not allowed to have relationships as a Korean boxer. He was having a pregnant yes. girlfriend in secret. Yes, that 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 is also part of it. I did want to bring up the forbidden love angle because I thought we had enough uh, passions and emotions swirling around. But yes, it was uh, they, they they adhered to the to the Mick philosophy from Rocky. Uh, women weaken legs was was a big thing in Korea. That was that was their mantra, which I don't think was written in blood. Do you, I mean, hey, not to get too bleak. Do you think that's why he died? <laughs> there might have been something to it. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Xavier is trying to find oxygen for himself. Somewhere. Yeah, that's, just, that's tough for me. I just, it, it's sad. And I, it, it's, that it, it led to like a lot of important, you know, rules that made boxing better, despite all of boxing still incredible amount of flaws. But there's just something about the, like, I, I really do like the white hat hacker analogy. Just, prodding the rule book, finding all the loopholes you could take advantage of to the point where the NHL had to just keep changing the rules based on things you did. I really like that. I don't know. That, that, that's just where I'm at right now, but it might also just be my own positive sensibilities. You pointing out that this is someone that is deliberately testing the rules and kind of trying to cause new rules to be made i think is is compelling me a little bit if because it's also helping me realize you could argue that technically ray mancini is responsible for the other rule change (laughs) it is fair (laughs) no that that is a fair point if if ray mancini just quits on the stool in round 10 all we have is a story story of a nice upset victory and you know, Dooku Kim goes on to like have like a somewhat notable career as a boxer in Mancini. Also, probably, you know, what's, if Mancini retires on the stool in round 10, does he go on to have a better career thereafter? Probably. Not dealing probably with has the like a Max Bayer thing going on, if nothing else. No, I, that I is, think with that. No, that's fair. That's fair. And look, I mean, you both brought some excellent pandering subjects. To the table for me this week, my my inner Philadelphian was truly torn between the Doctor of Dunk and I don't think Roger Nielsen has any cool nicknames. But what Captain he does Video. have, Captain Video, yeah. Captain Video, that's not a cool nickname. That's pretty. Cool. Bar- I, don't I don't know. I think that's a pretty cool nickname. There was Rule also Rulebook Rule Ro- Roger. Uh, Rulebook Roger one. it goes way better. Rulebook Roger <laughs> is so much better than. Captain I wasn't sure Video. if that sounded too nerdy to say, so I. Was holding off on that one. No, no, Captain Video is way nerdier than fucking rule. Like, if, if it was Rulebook Raj, that that would supplant Chocolate Thunder for me. As Raj was his ever. nickname, like his regular nickname. But I think the the Rulebook nickname was Rulebook Roger, and not Rulebook Raj. What's well, probably someone shortened it though. Look, I'm 
I'm not here to honor any rule books or any specifics. In fact, I think the, the whole theme of this episode today was the fact that rules are an ever living document. They are meant to be adjusted. They are meant to be changed. And it is our duty to honor guys that affect change, especially within this realm. And one of our favorite, at least one of my favorite Futurama things to, to quote is he is technically correct. It is the best kind, best of, correct. kind of correct. Roger Nielsen had technically legal strategies. They are the best kind of legal strategies. And because of that, we now must honor him with enshrinement in his second hall. But I think the most important one, our hall of guy. Welcome forever flyer, Roger Nielsen. Welcome I am shocked that Diaz has now, you know, gladly welcomed in someone that Xavier made very clear is like the father of hockey analytics. This is a huge, I think, growth moment for you, Diaz, to kind of. Here, here's the difference. I respect analytics when you keep them to yourself. <laughs> Diaz also <laughs> respects trolls. I do love trolls. I do love trolls. But yeah, like, you know, Daryl Morey always mentions he has these fucking hidden analytics. They say the Sixers have like a 10.2% chance of a championship or whatever the fuck. I love those things. Just keep them to yourself. I don't want to know about them. I don't want to know how you came up with them. Just that you have them. It's it's perfect. It's perfect. I love it. Well, this has been perfect. I I said at the beginning there, wasn't looking forward to doing this, frankly, and uh, still I'm not looking forward to <laughs> sports in general. That being said, I mean, I had a great time with my two very good friends here. And I hope you did too, dear listener. There are, of course, some people we need to thank in order for that time to exist. And those include producer Craig and all the coders behind him, uh, the good people of Sports Reference, who have provided many of our numbers, and our musical director, Don Ham, for that lovely theme music. Uh, if you, dear listener, want to continue to join us, you can always check us out on, uh, we are on Blue Sky now. We will probably stop being on Twitter at some point just because it fucking sucks to be there, man. It's just such a bummer every single time you log in. So you can check us on Blue Sky or Discord. Everything is at bit.ly slash, remember that guy, all one word, all lowercase. Do all the good stuff. Rate and review the show. We're super excited to be back for another phenomenal batch. And this one will take us pretty much through the end of the year. And we hope you continue to spend the rest of that year with us. Gentlemen, anything else? Nothing for me. I am a red basket case. Viva el octubre rojo. I've been James. I've been the very special guest, Xavier. And I'm Diaz. And as the babe once said in Benny Rodriguez's fever dream, heroes get remembered, but legends never die. Incredible. The but, mustache. Uh, Here's the one thing I'm going to say, Diaz. It's dangerously close to a Spencer Strider mustache for tonight <laughs> specifically. <laughs> Reclaiming it. Reclaiming it. <laughs> there we go. Look, I'm never mind. Craig's recording now, and I refuse to say words that can be jinxed against me. Uh, oh, do you now want to not say things, Mister Ninety Five World Series? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, are we are we being careful about the words that eggs in our mouth now? There are consequences now, I'm realizing. Oh, are there?